Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Ken Johnson, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming to you today from Jacksonville, Illinois, with a garden bite. And on this week's garden bite, we're going to talk about the dreaded bagworm. So if you had problems with bagworms in the past, have no fear. We still have plenty of time to do something about them before they start emerging. So before we get into to management on bagworms, talk a little bit about their life cycle. So bagworms are going to overwinter as eggs in the bags of the females. And a lot of times these eggs are going to be laid within the pupil casing of those female moths. Eventually those caterpillars will hatch and some of those caterpillars are going to spin silk strands, which is going to catch the one and it's going to carry caterpillars to other plants. And this is known as a ballooning. This is also something that sp a lot of spiders will do as well. You may have heard of it in reference to spiders. Other bagworms will stick on the same plant and they'll just hang around and, and feed there. So some will move off, some may stay if it's a really good plant and there's plenty of food. Regardless as if they stay or leave, eventually they're going to settle down and they'll start feeding. And it's commonly believed that bagworms only feed on evergreens. However, they've been found to feed on over 125 species of plants, both evergreen and deciduous, in 45 different plant families. So there's a lot of different types of plants they feed on. That being said, we most commonly see them on spruce, eastern red cedar, and other junipers, arborvitae, uh, white pines, so some of those evergreens. You can also find them on crabapple and oak. I've seen them on maple trees and other types of trees and shrubs as well. So when bagworms start feeding, they'll feed on the edges of broadleaf foliage. And sometimes, especially as they get bigger, they may make it down into the midvein. And then the leaves of needled evergreens are eaten back to the base of the plant until nothing remains. A lot of times they'll start at the tip and work their way down that needle. When we have early bagworm feeding, damage often appears kind of light green at first, and then whitish to brownish as those cells that have been damaged start to die. The, that foliage will start to turn brown. And like everything else, as bagworms get bigger and older, they start eating more and more, and a lot of times the entire leaves or the entire needle of the plant will be eaten. One of the problems with needled evergreens is that when they start feeding on those, that foliage, those needles, that can kill a branch, and if the infestation is really bad, entire trees could die, which doesn't happen all that often, but it is a possibility. Oftentimes, bagworms are starting off at the top of the tree, and they kind of work their way down. So it's not uncommon to see like the top third of an evergreen that is dead or has been completely defoliated. Fortunately, with deciduous trees, though they can refoliate, send out new leaves, and that damage is going to primarily be aesthetic. It's not as big of a concern with deciduous trees as it is with evergreens, and bagworms are going to feed throughout the summer. And the reason we call them bagworms is that they spin these individual silk kind of tents to cover up their bodies, and they will attach uh, foliage or frass or, or their poop uh, to those bags, and that's going to help camouflage them, which can make it kind of difficult to find them, especially when they're small. When they're constructing these bags, only the head and the thorax, so the front part of the insect of that caterpillar, is going to stick out of the bag. And that is going to allow it to move around and feed while still being primarily inside of the bag it's constructing. Now, if you were to open up the bag, uh, like we have in this picture, and, and take out this caterpillar, the back end of that caterpillar is going to be kind of brownish or dark brown in color, whereas the kind of the head and the thorax area is going to have yellow and dark brown patterns on it. And, and as they as the caterpillars grow, they will increase the size of these bags. And a lot of times they're kind of spindle shaped and they can be inch, inch and a half long when they're fully grown, when the caterpillars are fully grown. And as long as those caterpillars are, are feeding, they're going to keep adding pieces uh, of the foliage that they're feeding on onto that bag. So one kind of trick to know if bagworms are still feeding is the presence of green foliage on those bags. That bag is completely brown there's a good chance that insect has stopped feeding or it is dead or something like that if it still has green foliage it's still feeding eventually the caterpillars will finish developing they'll go through seven instars eventually they will then pupate within their bags so they will uh, they will attach their bags to a branch with with some more silk and this is a pretty strong strand of silk and they will pupate inside the bag they'll seal off the tip uh, and they'll pupate over a week to 10 days and then eventually the adults will emerge from those people. And, and adult, adult bagworms usually go unnoticed, uh, especially the females. The females do not leave the bags. She spends her entire life in the bag. Uh, and they're kind of, the females are kind of caterpillar like. Uh, they don't really look like a moth that you would typically think of. The wings are reduced, uh, the legs are reduced, all of that. 
Bales, on the other hand, they will emerge from their bags and they're capable of flying and they're kind of hairy and charcoal black in appearance. So once we have the adults, um, they're, they're going to be emerging in the fall. The females are going to release a pheromone that's going to attract the male moths to their bags. The males will then mate with the females while she's still inside of that bag. And once the female mates, she'll stop releasing that pheromone um, and will no longer be attractive to males. The males will no longer come to those bags. The females will then start to lay eggs. And again, they're laying these eggs inside of that bag, often inside of that pupil casing that's left behind. And the, either the female will then die within that bag or may fall out right before she dies. Neither the male or the female feeds. So basically, once they emerge, they're mating. Females are laying eggs. And that's it. Females can live for a couple of weeks. Males usually only live a couple of days. Basically, they mate and then they die. That's kind of the life cycle. So then the eggs are going to be overwintering, and then they will emerge uh, in the spring. So one of the easiest ways to manage bagworms in our landscapes is to handpick the bags off of plants. And we still have plenty of time to do this. So and when you're picking those, you want to make sure you either discard those bags or crush them, because if you just throw them on the ground, those eggs can still hatch, and those caterpillars can still get onto your trees and start feeding on them. So bagworms, I mentioned we still have a, lot of, still have a good amount of time before they hatch. Bagworms hatch. Um, at 600 growing degree days with a base 50, then that starts at March 1st, which if you're not familiar with growing degree days and how that works, that probably makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, but in Illinois, it's usually maybe mid to late May in Southern Illinois, and then going into June when we get up into Northern Illinois. So still plenty of time. Uh, if you want to learn more about the growing degree days, uh, you can check out the National Phenology Network uh, at usanpn.org. I've got a link to that uh, here on the screen. And we'll also put it in the show notes if you really want to check that out. And they have maps where you can track the, the growing degree day accumulation and how close we are getting to bagworm emergence. And they also have this for a lot of other insect pests as well. So once we kind of get close to that time where they're going to be start emerging, we want to start scouting for bagworms. So we want to start looking for early damage uh, on the leaves. So have some kind of scarifying. They may just be scraping off the surface of the leaves. Start looking for that. Uh, start looking for caterpillars walking around. You can open up bags if you still have bags on the trees and look to see if there's eggs in there um, that have hatched or not. And then once you start noticing that feeding damage, you start noticing in, uh, caterpillars on your plants, one thing you can do is spray for them. Uh, so sprays of Bacillus thuringiensis cristachii or BTK uh, or spinosad can be used. Um, these are pretty selective insecticides, uh, so they don't really harm non-pest insects all that much. Uh, and they're also organic if you're interested in organic products. But uh, a word of caution here, these products, like a lot of other things, become less effective uh, as the caterpillars get bigger. So they're much easier to control uh, with these little more specific organic type insecticides when they're younger. Uh, as they get bigger, you may have to look at things like you know, some of the pyrethroids uh, and things like that. But even then, they're going to have their limitations. Once they get really big, they get difficult to control. So like many other things, the sooner you can manage them, the more successful you'll be. And there are also a lot of different natural enemies uh, that will also help manage bagworms. So there's a lot of different types of parasitoid wasps. There have been over 11 species of parasitoid wasps that have been found to feed on bagworms. Uh, there's predators. Uh, mice will feed on them. Uh, larger wasps, wasps like bald-faced hornets have been uh, noted as feeding on them. So a lot of things will eat bagworms, even birds uh, will eat them as well. So another thing we can do, kind of a little more long-term, maybe sustainable approach to managing bagworms is planting flowers. So like I mentioned, parasitoid wasps will feed on them. Other wasps will feed on them. And these these wasps, both parasitoid and more predatory wasps, they are using, the in the case of this case, the caterpillars of bagworms as food for their offspring. So the parasitoid wasps are laying their eggs in the bagworms and the larvae are feeding them. Something like a bald-faced hornet will cut open that bag, pull out that bagworm, chew it up, and then feed it to its offspring. But the adults, they feed primarily on pollen and nectar, so they are pollinators. So these insects are acting as pollinators and predators. So if we have a lot of floral resources, a lot of flowers for them, that's going to provide food sources for these adults, which will attract them to your landscape and keep them around long term. So there's a study in 2005 that kind of shows how beneficial it can be to have flowering plants uh, near plants that are going to be attacked by bagworms. So maybe if you have a lot of problems with bagworms on your evergreens, maybe plant a flower bed by 
or flower bed nearby. So in this study, they found 70% of the bagworms that were on plants that had a flower bed nearby were parasitized by these parasitoid wasps. On the other hand, bagworms that were on trees and stuff that weren't near flower beds, they only had 40% parasitized. So you had 30% more bagworms are parasitized when you had flower beds nearby. So if you consistently have issues with bagworms, maybe consider putting a flower bed in nearby your plants. That's all I've got for you for this week's Garden Bites. Thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching, and as always, keep on growing. 